Mahatma Gandhi, his basic premises of political thought. You know, friends, that Mahatma Gandhi, these two words do not only revive in our minds the image of the towering personality of a man who led India to freedom or of a person whose picture appears on Indian currency notes, but these two words also do stand for certain values and visions. Values which the human civilization will cherish forever as long as violence exists in this world. And these visions were the visions of social and political reconstructions in a unique way which stand opposite to the modern Western concept of politics and society. In fact, they offer a critique, a very formidable critique of modern Western modernity. It is noteworthy that Gandhiji, who was born on 2nd October 1869 in Orbandar, got his titular prefix, the Mahatma, during his struggling career in politics. And it was Tagore, his long-term friend, who always accepted, he had accepted this term and always addressed Gandhiji as the Mahatma, the great soul. And on his part, uh, Gandhiji too addressed uh, the poet as Gurudev or the Guru. These two persons, these, these two great persons remained friends forever uh, despite occasional differences on different issues and they held highest respect for each other. To understand the basic contours of Mahatma Gandhi's political thought, we have to understand some of the basic premises of his thought. But these basic premises are not any fixed categories. They are not fixed categories. They are not essentialist kind of categories. And Gandhi, you know, did not believe in fool's consistency. In 1933, he reminded and cautioned his readers in such words. And I'm quoting from Gandhi. I would like to say to the diligent reader of my writings and to others who are interested in them that I am not at all concerned with appearing to be consistent. In my search after truth, I have discarded many ideas and learned many new things. When anybody finds any inconsistency between any two of writings of mine, he would, well, he would do well to choose the letter of the two on the same subject. Thus, while discussing Gandhi's basic premises of thought, we have to keep this in mind that we should consider them not as fixed categories but as subjects in terms of continuity and change. And let us come to our first category that is the East-West differentiation. The East-West differentiation as popularized and essentialized by the Western Oriental scholars formed a very important and perhaps probably one of the very important uh, 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 epistemological categories of Indian political thought itself. These scholars built a kind of an orient, the notion of an orient, which is almost unchangeable and static. And on the opposite, they made an image of the Occident or the West, which, is, which was very powerful, rational, and uh, dynamic. Uh, in recent times, Edward Said, the great writer, he has drawn our attention to this. And this essentialist kind of image of Orient and Occident uh, was believed by many thinkers of Indian political thought. Most of the thinkers, they believed in such kind of differentiations and categories. Also, the administrators, British administrators, who made policies, they also believed in this differentiation. And this 
pop, this uh, kind of differentiation uh, got most popular expression perhaps in the in these oft quoted lines of Rudyard Kipling when he says, "Oh, east is east, and west is west, and the twin." shall never meet. This discourse had also a deep influence on Gandhi since his uh, formative years. He referred to, in his autobiography, he referred to uh, the Gujarati poet Narmad, who wrote a very popular doggerel, which ran like this. Behold, the mighty Englishman, he rules the Indian small, because being a meat eater, he is five cubits tall. Thus the English ruled India due to their physical strength and which came from meat eating. And uh, uh, you know that uh, meat eating uh, was a sin in the eyes of a traditional Vaishnavite set to which Gandhi belonged. So even when he first uh, set his steps towards uh, 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 westernization by eating meat secretly, which he did, and uh, there was a sense of guilt. And the confession, which he made later, was but a logical follow-up. Later, he closely watched the wasteful and materialist life of the industrialized West when he went to England as a student to study law. And he was first struck by the splendor, grandeur, and frivolity of the Western cities like uh, London and Paris. But soon, his ascetic mind discovered the futility of the total show. By contrast, the ancient or the Indian civilization stood for village life, simple village life, and a spiritual life. They believed in plain living and high thinking. Therefore, Gandhi said, Indian civilization lives in the villages. And I quote, if the village perishes, India will perish too. But it was not a simplistic rejection of the West. Despite his dislikes for the, uh, this westful splendor of Western cities and industrialized life, he also discovered spiritual life among the charge goers. As if, he, 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 uh, he wrote, as if these charge goers and their practices stood noticeably apart from the luxury of the Western life. Therefore, there was little doubt that Oriental and Occidental civilizations came out from the same root. They are the two branches of the same root. But the only difference was the modern civilization. The modern and machine-based civilization based on industrialized and urban life, which had disempowered, according to Gandhi, the millions of masses in the countryside and had concentrated economic and political power in the hands of the few. Now we come to another important category of Gandhi's thought, that is caste. Caste, you know, is a very important marker of Indian society. Although theoretically, it is a distorted form of ancient Varnasrama or Varna system. In reality, it stands for hereditary inequality in terms of occupation, marriage, uh, uh, interdining, taking uh, food or beverages among each others, and uh, and all the important modern Indian political thinkers had to grapple with this social reality and uh, this burning issue. Gandhi was no exception. But like Tagore, his friend, Gandhi also initially conceived it as a distorted form of ancient Indian Varna system. But Varna system, you know, uh, was a kind of a the, uh, choice of different uh, choice of different occupations according to ability. Gandhi recognized the caste problem as a problem of both society and of the nation. 
he wrote, it is harmful both to spiritual and national growth. Yet he stood for Varnasrama as a healthy division of work based on birth. He again wrote, there is no question with me of superiority or inferiority. It is purely a question of duty. It is a unique invention, according to him, of Hinduism, because it, if all of us follow this law of Varna, we would limit our material ambition. It is to be reminded here that in 1920s, Gandhi did not directly attack caste system and especially uh, the, inter the problems which lay with interdining or intermarriage among different castes. He wrote, it is no part of a Hindu's duty to dine with the sun. And by restricting his choice of a bride to a particular group, he exercises rare self-restraint. The main issue at that time was putting up of a united front of caste, class, communities and different population groups against the British. And uh, he, therefore, he didn't want to directly attack the caste system in 1920s. Uh, he wanted to undermine the system from within. But soon, the attack, especially on untouchability, became very severe. He called the so-called low-cast untouchables as Harijans, men of God, while the other people he called as Durjans, that is, men of evil. And he declared, and I quote, Hinduism has sinned in giving sanction to untouchability. It was a later development. It has disregarded us and made us pariahs. It is noteworthy that Gandhi did not find the word Harijan overnight. He used Bhangi, untouchable, unapproachable, Panchama, Antaya for a long time till he got the right word, that is Harijan in 1931. Here it should be mentioned that two famous Gandhi scholars, one Professor Dennis Dalton and another Professor Budhode Bhattacharya, they had seen the development of the notion of caste in Gandhi's thought as a change which wanted to bring in some, some changes, but not revolutionary, but evolutionary changes. Reform, according to them, was his purpose, and evolution was his process. And the purpose of caste reform, according to Dalton, was to create unity out of cultural diversity. Now we come to another, another category. The category is the category of class, social class and economic class also. The concept of class and class struggle, they did not occupy any uh, significant uh, place in Gandhi's formative years. During the middle of his career, that is when he came back to India in 1915, after that in 1920s, since then till his death, he had to face again and again this question of class, class antagonism, class war, etc. These questions recurred again and again. But here we must understand that Gandhi's uh, views on social hierarchy, basic premise of Gandhi's view on social hierarchy was like this, that he believed that there existed and there would exist forever certain inherent inequalities among men. But that should not come according to him in the way of equitable distribution of resources and opportunities and other things. But an ideal, ideal model, an uh, ideal method to uh, uh, solve this pro uh, problem of, cast, uh, of class was to bring in harmony, to bring in the principle of harmony among social groups, among the classes and castes. Such an arrangement, such an arrangement fitted well 
with his philosophical structure, political understanding, and social views. During a talk with the Zamindars in 1934, Gandhi, who were very anxious that uh, at that time CSP, that is the Congress Socialist Party, had taken a resolution that it would uh, like to uh, see that the, uh, uh, there, there is no more uh, private property in the hands of the Zamindars, no more land in the hand of the Zamindars. So Zamindars became very anxious and came to Gandhi. And to them, to Gandhi tried to relieve them because, you know, because Gandhi wanted to assimilate all in that united platform. Gandhi uh, assured them by saying, I am working for the cooperation and coordination of capital and labor of landlord and tenant. But Gandhi not only opposed class war, he ruled out exploitation. In his words, you have said that non-violence solves un unemployment. You were right for it rules out exploitation. But how could one, on one hand, rule out exploitation and yet, on the other hand, deny the abolition of private property? The solution found was conversion of the property classes into trustees of the people. During a, a conversation with the young British communists, he argued, if the people with more talents, and I quote, use their abilities in their best spirit, they will be working to the benefit of the people. Those people will be trustees and nothing more. Community. This is also a very important category in Gandhi's thought. According to Concise Dic Oxford Dictionary, the word Community stands for many things. Organized, political, municipal and social body. And also it meant a body of men having common religion. It is strictly in this sense we will use the word community here. Gandhi, as a nationalist leader, faced these questions more often, more often than the class question. Born in an orthodox Vaishnavite sect, Vaishnavite family, he observed many rights and restrictions imposed by the family and the sect. But his religion always for him a personal matter, not a matter of community. For him, his Hinduism or Vaishnavism was a, was a matter of religion, not of community. With this spirit of mind, he grew up as a politician independently in South Africa, far away from the revivalist extremist atmosphere of the late 19th century India. There he stressed, and there he had to stress, because uh, Hindus, Muslims, all were, all were the uh, targets of that racist regime at that time in South Africa. And he wanted to foster a unity among all the Indians, irrespective of their religious beliefs. He began to study their various interpretations of different religions. And this comparative study helped him understand that there was no fundamental differences between these religions, as all of them were engaged in the pursuit of truth, that is, God. Back home, he was deeply absorbed in the promotion of communal harmony and especially a communal unity between Hindus and Muslims was his prime concern. It was an objective which Gandhi strove to attain till his death. And he wrote, What then does the Hindu-Muslim unity consist in and how can it be best promoted? The answer is simple. It consists in our having a common purpose, a common goal, and common sorrows. It is best promoted by cooperating to reach common goals, by sharing another's sorrows, and by mutual toleration. This common goal was self-government, 
and sharing common sorrows and uh, 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 it meant supporting the Muslims, especially on the Khilafat issue uh, in the context of 1920. Despite bitter criticism from both the communities and especially from his own community, that is Hindu community, he did not accuse superficially any particular community for communal violence. And he just did not believe in rumors because these rumors, according to him, were non-proven. Even when the Muslim League preached to the two-nation theory and demanded the creation of Pakistan, Gandhi didn't believe that the Muslims, Muslims would want to dismember India. But when Pakistan came to be a reality, and worst kind of communal riots broke out, uh, Gandhi tirelessly preached the message of communal harmony and mutual toleration. Thus, even the birth of Pakistan, which according to him was worse than foreign domination, Gandhi's basic premise of the, on the communal question uh, remained unshaken. Now we come to another category of Gandhi, uh, which is violence and non-violence, war and peace. Gandhi almost deified the idea of non-violence or ahimsa. He wrote, I claim to be a votary of truth from my childhood. It was the most natural thing to me. My prayerful search gave me the revealing maxim, truth is God, instead of God is truth. Thus the search for truth was also the search for God. And in his autobiography, which is also known as My Experiments with Truth, Gandhi again stressed that Ahimsa is the basis for such truth. I am realizing every day that such truth is in vain unless it is founded on Ahimsa as the basis. And he grounded his unique movement on, uh, uh, of Satyagraha on the bedrock of Ahimsa. But non-violence wa was not meant for the cowards. He said, true non-violence non is an impossibility without possession of unadulterated fearlessness. He further held, where there is only a choice between cowardice and violence, I would advise violence. Perhaps all these provide a clue to his characterization of people's resistance on two occasions at least as almost non-violent. He gave two examples when the Polish people resisted uh, uh, violently with arms, I mean uh, the uh, uh, Nazi aggressor and also aggressors and then he also gave the instance when uh, uh, he called it almost non-violent when violence broke out in many parts of India during the Quit India movement. And Gandhi's non-violence was not passive but active or militant. It was almost a war. He said non-violence, his satyagraha was almost a war without violence. And here by war he meant a war between right and wrong. We come to our concluding category, that is spontaneity, creativity versus discipline and ascetism. Unlike Tagore, Gandhi cared much less for human creativity. Tagore cared for self-expression. He was an artist, so Tagore cared for self. He preached the idea of self-expression while Gandhi preached the idea of self-realization. And he said, the art of that nature, that is the art which promotes this kind of self-realization has greatest possible appeal for me. And he continued, all true art must help the soul to realize its inner self. In my own case, I find that I can do entirely without external forms in my soul's realization. My room may have blank walls and I may even dispense with the roof so that I may gaze out upon 
the starry heavens. What conscious art of man can give me the panoramic scenes that open out before me when I look up in the sky above with all its starry nights and shining stars? And he also was very much influenced by Raskin's, John Raskin's uh, uh, instance of bread lever theory, where everybody, all intellectuals, have to work to earn their bread. And to the question whether persons like Rabindranath Tagore or C. V. Raman had to earn their bread uh, through labor or not, Gandhi's answer was, intellectual work is important and has an undoubted place in the scheme of life. But what I insist on is the necessity of physical labor. No man, I claim, ought to be free from that obligation. Thank you very much.